So we'll start part two off with tying together some loose ends, and that's the connection with Hogan and Hartson, Loretta Lynch, Sandy Berger, and Cheryl Mills. As you can see here, Loretta Lynch became a litigation partner at Hogan and Hartson beginning in March 2002 through April 2010. By the way, Bill Clinton nominated Loretta Lynch for U.S. Attorney Eastern District of New York in 1999. Then we have Sandy Berger, who worked there on and off for quite some time. Sandy Berger was also a partner, and he opened numerous international offices. In fact, he was touted as spearheading the international spread, if you will, of Hogan and Hartson. And then we have Cheryl Mills, who was just an associate. But if you look at the timeline here, if you look at Sandy Berger leaving in 1992, it looks as though he took Cheryl Mills with him to work on the Clinton campaign. And according to this April 8, 2008 article from the American Lawyer, Hogan and Hartson has been Bill and Hillary Clinton's go-to guy for tax advice since 2004. And keep in mind that Loretta Lynch was a litigation partner from March 2002 to April 2010 at Hogan and Hartson. Howard Topaz is also a partner with Hogan and Hartson, and they had been doing the Clinton's annual tax returns from 2004 to 2008. Is this a conflict in interest for Loretta Lynch to be investigating the Clintons? Does it make the connection with Hogan and Hartson, Loretta Lynch, Sandy Berger, and Cheryl Mills simply acquaintances or thick as thieves? Let's see if we can find that out. But first, we'll do a timeline on James Comey. The FBI director, Mr. Comey, is, is personally compromised. He's complicit in this scandal. From what I've found, it started with the Whitewater scandal. In the mid-90s, James Comey signed on as Deputy Special Counsel to the Senate Whitewater Committee. In 1996, after months of work, Comey came to some damning conclusions. Hillary Clinton was personally involved in mishandling documents and had ordered others to block investigators as they pursued their case. Worse, her behavior fit into a pattern of concealment. Bill and Hillary tried to hide their roles in two other matters under investigation by law enforcement. Taken together, the interference by White House officials, which included destruction of documents, amounted to far more than just aggressive lawyering or political naivety. Comey and his fellow investigators concluded that it constituted a highly improper pattern of deliberate misconduct. However, Comey was not in charge of the case and his superiors decided not to press charges against Bill or Hillary Clinton in the matter. James Comey is then moved on to New York, where he finds no wrongdoing with the Clinton cartel. That's with the clemency in the four Hasidic Jews, Mark Rich, and the other 175 pardons that Clinton gave in exchange for votes and pay for play. We learned that in part one. He then went from the Southern District of New York, which by the way is where the 9-11 attacks happened, and was placed by George Bush as the Deputy Attorney General in December of 2003 until August of 2005, serving under the Bush administration. And this is where Sandy Berger comes into play. In part one, I briefly went over what happened with Sandy Berger. Now I would like to go into this in more detail because if it weren't for this video, the Sandy Berger caper, this in-depth report about what happened with Sandy Berger, I would never have known about what James Comey's role is in this whole situation. But what really caught my eye was the timeline of James Comey. It was incredible. So let's get started. Now, Berger made four trips to the National Archives and, according to him, only took a handful 
of the Millennium Alert After Action Reviews. But there is no way on the face of this planet to prove or disprove what he says. So let's look at the timeline here. Berger's initial visit to the National Archives was on May 30th, 2002. On July 18th, 2003, he said that he did remove some classified documents. On September 2nd, 2003, he visited the archives again. On October 2nd, 2003, is when the archive staff noticed that Berger was in fact stealing. They set up a kind of a sting. At the time, Sandy Berger was preparing for his testimony on behalf of the Clinton administration before the 9-11 Commission. He told investigators he stole the documents so he could work on his presentation at home. But that didn't add up to National Archives Inspector General Paul Brockfeld, who referred the case to the Department of Justice. My first concern was, did Mr. Berger have access to original documents and could he, re he have removed additional documents? And the second concern I had was, would the 9-11 Commission be informed of Mr. Berger's activity or actions prior to his providing testimony? Because I believed that if I was the 9-11 Commission, I would want to know the truth and veracity of a witness. Did you pass on that concern to the Justice Department? Yes, I did. And what did they say? Um, the Justice Department said that they would take the lead in this matter, that they, I, I trusted the Justice Department to act appropriately. Did they? To this day, I'm not quite sure what they told the 9-11 Commission. But Fox News has learned what the Justice Department told the 9-11 Commission. Zilch. That's right, for nearly three months after Sandy Berger was caught red-handed, stealing, hiding, and then destroying highly sensitive government documents, the Justice Department told the 9-11 Commission nothing. Finally, in early January 2004, 9-11 Commission Chairman Lee Hamilton and Tom Kane were told Berger was under investigation. But the call came not from Justice, but from then White House General Counsel Alberto Gonzalez. Gonzalez had also been told of Berger's caper. So we have Alberto Gonzalez letting the 9-11 Commission know in January that Sandy Berger had stolen classified documents. Also, on January 14, 2004, which was the day that Berger first testified before the 9-11 Commission, Brockfeld met with DOJ attorney Howard Sklamberg. Concerned that Berger had obstructed the 9-11 Commission's work, Brockfeld wanted assurance that the Commission knew of Berger's crime and the potential ramifications of it. He didn't get it. Since James Comey was the Deputy Attorney General, did James Comey know about Sandy Berger? Let's take a closer look at James Comey. On October 3rd, 2003, President George Bush nominated Jim Comey to serve as Deputy Attorney General. He was unanimously confirmed by the Senate on December 9th, 2003, and the President signed his commission on December 11th, 2003. I just want to point out that Sandy Berger was busted for stealing archives on October the 2nd, 2003. James Comey was nominated by George Bush for Deputy Attorney General on October the 3rd, 2003. Also, Paul Brockfeld, the Office of Inspector General of the National Archives, met with a DOJ attorney in January of 2004, January 14th to be exact, the same day that Sandy Berger was to testify at the 9-11 Commission for the first time. And Alberto Gonzalez told the 9-11 Commission in January of 2004 about the Sandy Berger caper. The 9-11 Commission was established in 2002. America was relying on it to find out what went wrong and what we needed to do to prevent being hit again. But by the spring of 2004, the 9-11 Commission would devolve into partisan finger pointing that threatened to undermine any report it would issue. The Commission was rapidly losing credibility. 
One could only imagine how bad it would get if the country were additionally to find out that President Clinton's national security advisor and his administration's point man in the investigation had been stealing top secret terror documents from the National Archives. But that's not all that was happening at that time. You see, James Comey became a hero of sorts because he refused to sign on to the extension of the warrantless wiretapping program from the Bush administration. Yes, James Comey saved America from being spied on at the same time that the Clinton administration's National Security Advisor was being investigated for stealing classified documents from the National Archives and destroying them in reference to 9-11. Let's hear from James Comey, shall we? In the early part of 2004, the Department of Justice was engaged, the Office of Legal Counsel under my supervision, in a reevaluation both factually and legally of a particular classified program. Now, this particular program was the President's Surveillance Program, also known as Stellar Wind, and this is a review of the DOJ's involvement with the Stellar Wind program. According to this Inspector General report on page 118, and it's actually page 132 of the PDF, Comey became the Deputy Attorney General on December 9, 2003, and he was read in to the Stellar Wind program on February 17, 2004. Comey told us that he had no awareness of the program prior to being read in. Comey had told us that the NSA Director Hayden personally wanted to conduct Comey's read-in to the program. Hayden read in Comey at the Justice Command Center in a briefing that took approximately 20 to 30 minutes. Comey told us that his initial reaction to the program was unprintable. He said that he thought that the NSA could not collect the content of certain communications covered by the program outside of the FISA authority. Hayden, the director of the NSA, told the OIG, the Office of Inspector General, that Comey raised no objections to him about the program upon being read in. And it was a program that was renewed on a regular basis and required signature by the Attorney General certifying to its legality. And the, and I remember the precise date, that the program had to be renewed by March the 11th, which was a Thursday of 2004. Just to let you know, March the 24th would be the second testimony of Sandy Berger, because on March the 22nd, two days before Berger's public testimony, before the 9-11 Commission, senior DOJ attorneys John Dion and Bruce Schwartz got back to Brockfeld and they told him that the DOJ was not going to notify the 9-11 Commission of the Berger investigation before Berger's appearance because Paul Brockfeld was very concerned about this. And we were engaged in a very intensive reevaluation of the matter and a week before that March 11th deadline, I had a private meeting with the Attorney General for an hour, just the two of us, and I laid out for him what we had learned and what our analysis was of this particular matter. And uh, at the end of that hour-long private session, he and I agreed on a course of action. And within hours, he was stricken and taken very, very ill. You thought, just some, you thought something was wrong with how it was being operated or administered or overseen? We had, yes, we had concerns as to our ability to certify its legality, and which was our obligation for the program to be renewed. The Attorney General was taken that very afternoon to George Washington Hospital, where he went into intensive care and remained there for over a week, and I became the acting Attorney General. And over the next week, particularly the following week on Tuesday, we communicated to the relevant parties at the White House and, and elsewhere our decision that, as Acting Attorney General, I would not certify the program as to its legality. So, did James Comey save America by exposing the spying program, or was he just doing his job to cover the behinds of the Clintons? 
you have to ask yourself. James Comey is the FBI director, and there are surveillance drones all over America. You'd think James Comey wouldn't like that, would you? The FBI also likes spying on journalists, as well as spying on school kids. So, do you think James Comey cared about the American people then, or was he just doing his job? To clean up after the Clintons. We now know, don't we? So let's move on with James Comey's timeline. August of 2005, when James Comey left the DOJ and became general counsel and senior vice president of Lockheed Martin, which was based in Bethesda, Maryland. He stayed there for five years until 2010. And in 2010, Comey's last year at Lockheed Martin, he earned more than six million dollars in compensation and it just so happens that Lockheed Martin became a Clinton Global Initiative member in 2010 the very same year that Comey received six million dollars in compensation as a side note Lockheed Martin is also a member of the American Chamber of Commerce in Egypt which paid Bill Clinton $250,000 to deliver a speech in 2010. Also in 2010, Lockheed Martin won 17 approvals for private contracts from the Hillary Clinton State Department. Oh, and here's a CBS News article from January 12, 2011. Is Lockheed Martin shadowing you? Lockheed Martin received $36 billion in government contracts in 2008 alone, more than any company in history. And that's when James Comey was general counsel and senior vice president of Lockheed Martin. Remember, from 2005 to 2010, that was his job. And that was one year after the performance of a lifetime that James Comey gave right here when he saved America from the spying program in which Lockheed Martin supplies all the spying apparatus. For instance, biometric identification devices that will know who you are by scanning your iris, recognizing your face, or coming up with novel ways of collecting your fingerprints or DNA. And they have a wonderful contract to install 3,000 security cameras and motion sensors that would spot packages, as well as people carrying them, and notify the authorities. They count you for the census. While making ballistic missiles, they process your taxes, access your fingerprints, scan your packages, and ensure that it's easier than ever to collect your DNA. Lockheed Martin's interest in getting inside your private life via intelligence collection and surveillance has remained remarkably undiminished in the 21st century. James Comey has the audacity to sit there in a hearing in Congress and talk about the privacy of America. Folks, we've been had by the cleaner. We'll move on to 2010 when Comey left Lockheed Martin and went to Bridgewater Associates, which is a hedge fund based in Westport, Connecticut. He left Bridgewater in 2013, which, by the way, is the world's largest hedge fund. Upon leaving Bridgewater, he received $3 million as a payout when he was confirmed as the FBI head seems as though James Comey went right from Bridgewater to HSBC where he became the director of HSBC Holdings. He became that on March 4th, 2013. When it comes to HSBC, WorldNet Daily has the scoop. Let's check out what WorldNet Daily has reported about HSBC. I was the Vice President, Senior Business Relationship Manager. Job involved helping businesses manage their business life, manage their finances, manage their trade, manage transactions, wire transfers, checking accounts. And John, uh, you have written a book. Can you show us yes. the book? World Banking, World Fraud, Using Your Identity. Great. Thank you. 
And, uh, okay, so you recognize that these are papers that um, you provided me? Yes. So these are papers that you pulled out of the bank's computer system, is that these correct? These are right straight from the bank's computer system. And you pulled these because you suspected they were fraudulent transactions, is that I correct? I pulled these because I thought they were suspicious activities taking place, and these same documents I brought to senior security within the bank. Now John, you realize what you're saying is that bank employees including bank security officers and fairly senior officers of the bank are involved then in a pattern of illegal activity. Is that that's what correct. Saying? That's what I'm saying and that's what I've re that's what I've also recorded in my voice recorders during meetings with managers with senior security. I have hours upon hours of voice recordings. And I get the bank security at HSBC did not stop the illegal activity or the, <clears throat> the suspicious activity. According to George, his own words were, when I find Who's George, George Petranger is a senior security officer of HSBC Bank. He says, John, when I find fraud in the bank, I have to report it to my forces, the executives in the bank. I am only allowed to report maybe 10% to law enforcement. That 10% law enforcement cannot work with because it is incomplete. That is purposely done by executives. So the system's designed so when law enforcement gets the information, the bank has not given them enough? Not even that. I brought this information to law enforcement and they said they gave it back to the bank to do their own internal investigation. So we're, it's a cycle. It's a circle. It's not going nowhere. It's gonna stay in that circle until somebody breaks it. Uh, do you believe you were fired for bringing these suspicious accounts to the attention of the bank management and bank security? Yes, well, senior security, George Trenga told me I was going to get fired for this. I mean, you should have been, why weren't you given meritorious awards for bringing forward a potentially suspicious activity? Because this is how the bank makes money. This is how employees in the bank make money. It's a lot easier to make money off doing fraudulent transactions than it is making money off legal transactions. And John, you realize, I mean, these are serious <laughs> accusations against a bank, yes. major bank, HSBC, one of the major banks in the world. Yes. Against people, and you've named the individuals in the bank. Yes. You realize you could be sued for libel or defamation. If you're sue me. Are. If you want to sue me, please sue me. Sue me all you want and then bring out the proof. I will ask for every document. I will ask for a lot of documents and I will show that I am right and I will give every tape recording to the public on air and they can listen to these individuals talking. WND has been great. They're the first and only news agency to put my story on the air, to put my story on the web, to put my story out to people. Well, why did it take a story to be published when they had the information prior? And why did the other <clears throat> news agencies not pick it up? Now, John, I received a, an email after we wrote some articles in WND. I received an email uh, from uh, Frank Di Gregorio, who um, I'll show you the emails here and see if you recognize them. Um, who is uh, an official with Homeland Security, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. In fact, I have his card Frank here. Frank Di Gregorio and Keith Graham Klein. Now, uh, I've met with these gentlemen, and have you met with these gentlemen as well, or talked to them? I've talked to them on the phone, and I've never met with them. And did you turn over the material you have here? Back in 2010, my attorneys from Napoli, Bipik, and Burns turned over evidence to Frank. You tape-recorded conversations with federal law enforcement officers? Yes. Including Department of Homeland Security and IRS, you did all that because you didn't believe or you were suspicious that they would take you seriously? Or why? My biggest thing was just covering myself, and I didn't know what would happen. And you never know what's going to happen. Somebody could say, oh, you're involved. Well, no, I'm not. I reported it. Well, no, you didn't report it. And it's simple like this. I went to Homeland Security. My attorneys went to Homeland Security back in 2010. Homeland Security said they never went. They never. My attorneys never spoke to them. They don't know who I am or nothing. They I know that, that I'm today. They, they said that today. Now, they, no, they said that on February 7th of this year, 2012, that nobody contacted them two years ago. And I said to Frank, because he was saying he was calling me, he was belittling me. Frank who is Frank? Frank DiGirio, Frank and, and, and Mr. Klein. 
and uh, they would be belittling me, saying, oh, I'm a disruptive employee, I'm just here for the money, and all going on and on. And I said to them, I said, you know, they're like, why did it take you two years? Why did it take you two years, huh? And they were going, no. I'm like, you know something? I'll be very happy to answer your question if you can answer me one question. And they're like, what? Frank's like, what? I go, why did it finally take you two years to get back to me? They're like, what are you talking about? I said, you had, I told you, you had this information two years ago, and the only reason you contact me now is because the article that World Net Daily put out about Mexican drug cartel, about money being laundered, which was told to me that this what, what this was by senior DAs, Pashu Okei and Jeremy Shalepi in Suffolk County. That's the only reason you're calling me now. So, what's going to happen now? And he goes, well, they, and he said, well, the DA's not going to say they said that. They're not going to say that. I said, they don't have to. I recorded it. He yeah, goes, it was and, only after and he I dropped wrote, the phone. And only after I wrote the article so they contacted you for the second set of interviews. Yes, but that was on February 7th. And then they said they would get back to me in two weeks. I've never heard from them again. Now, you've also been contacted by um, the IRS. Is that correct? I contacted the IRS. The IRS employees, which is David Wagner, he's a special agent, and Keith Sophia who is a supervisory special agent. And you met with these two gentlemen where? I met with them in Denver, Colorado, in their office. I gave them a disc with all the documents on it. And Detective Sophia, he just, he said to me, what would make us believe that employees would say they know about fraudulent activities going on? Because that's illegal. I said, you can listen to them on the tape. And he just looked at me, he goes, you have them on tape? And I said, yes, I recorded everything. I gave them two discs with voice recordings on them, approximately 19, 20 hours of voice recordings of employees talking about the forge activities going on, knowing the forge is going on. He's just like, in my whole life and career in the IRS, I have never been given so much information on a bank. I've never seen so much information. He goes, this is just mind boggling. And they are looking, into the voice recordings I gave them, documentation I gave them. And if everything shows what I told them, what I told them was on the paperwork and what I showed them was on the voice recordings, they were talking about arresting employees. I mean, you could be jeopardizing the jobs of these federal. You basically told me today. Excuse me, I'm not jeopardizing their job. They are jeopardizing their job, but not doing their job. And you're saying Department of Homeland Security, IRS, District Attorney's Office, Queens County, Suffolk District Attorney's Office. Yes, your Jeremy Shalepi and Patrick McKay. You've named all these people. Yes. And you're calling them out and saying they aren't doing their jobs. Is Correct. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, the IRS has just begun. In the IRS, let's get this clear. You've got records here of millions of dollars, potentially billions of dollars going through these accounts to Social Security numbers. And the IRS has not been paid on a penny of this. Is this correct? That's correct. So there's conceivably billions of dollars of tax revenue here that's not been collected. That is billions to trillions. I mean, there's a lot of money at stake here. We're talking a lot, a lot of money. Taxpayers. And you're saying the, the, the federal government law enforcement officers made aware of this, have not taken steps immediately correct. To, to stop this. That is correct. So, as you heard, the HSBC whistleblower went everywhere to try to report this information. No one did anything until WND finally posted the report in reference to what the whistleblower was saying. And then the Senate finally released a report. Now, how fair do you think that report is from the Senate when most of the people are probably receiving money that's in the Senate somehow from HSBC. And then you finally get a wrist slap from HSBC just to pay $1.9 billion in the money laundering case. And what I find interesting are the people who were involved in that case. Listen to who was in on that case. Loretta Lynch, she was the attorney in Brooklyn where HSBC is. She said compliance was woefully inadequate. And here's one for you. 
In trying to reach a result that's fair and just and powerful, you also have to look at the collateral consequences. DOJ criminal chief Lanny Brewer said at the Brooklyn press conference. Well, <laughs> folks, guess who Lanny Brewer is? He was Sandy Berger's lawyer on the case that Sandy Berger stole all of those files. You can't make this stuff up, folks. You just can't. We are no longer a country. We are a banana republic run by a criminal cartel. And we can't forget about the wonderful connections that Breitbart has made with James the Cleaner Comey and the Clinton Foundation and James Comey's brother, Peter. According to Breitbart, when their source called the Chinatown offices of DC law firm DLA Piper and asked for Peter Comey, a receptionist immediately put him through to Comey's direct line. But Peter Comey is not featured on the DLA Piper website. Peter Comey serves as Senior Director of Real Estate Operations for the Americas for DLA Piper. James Comey was not questioned about his relationship with Peter Comey in his confirmation hearing. DLA Piper is the firm that performed the independent audit of the Clinton Foundation in November during the Clinton's first big push into the email scandal behind them. DLA Piper's employees taken as a whole represent a major Hillary Clinton 2016 campaign donation block and Clinton Foundation donation base. DLA Piper ranks number five on Hillary Clinton's all-time career top contributors list, just ahead of Goldman Sachs. And it just goes on from there about James Comey financing a house that his brother Peter lives in in Virginia. It, it just doesn't stop. So knowing all the sly moves that James Comey has made and knowing that he was a director of HSBC, how in the world can Comey possibly investigate Hillary Clinton when according to the Clinton Foundation website, they say they are intimately involved with HSBC? The Clinton Foundation makes that statement. So let's take a quick peek at how the Clinton Foundation is involved with HSBC. I'm at the Clinton Foundation here. CPC Green Initiative. Millions have been committed to NELP from CPC, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley. And then they are installing rainwater harvesting systems with funding from HSBC. And how awesome! They're building the corporate coalition. Mussolini would be so proud! Government leaders that include the leaders of BP and HSBC. Investing in management and leadership in Vietnam. Unaccompanied minor immigration awareness campaign. Conducted an outdoor screening tour. Funded by HSBC. So is it any wonder that in mid-June 2013, President Obama nominated James Comey as the director of the FBI. When? Those of you who don't know, we use the Freedom of Information Act, the FOIA law, to uncover government records. We were investigating a few years ago the Benghazi scandal, and we noticed in our lawsuits that Hillary Clinton didn't have any emails that were coming to us from the Obama administration. So just to be sure, we asked for Clinton emails related to Benghazi. And sure enough, the government, towards the end of 2014, uh, started making noises that there may be other documents they need to look at. And then in February of 2015, they told the court, they gave everything to Judicial Watch, but there may be other documents they need to look at. And then a few weeks later, the New York Times reports that the Clinton, uh, about the basics of the Clinton email scandal, that she was using uh, a Clinton server, uh, a private server, or what she thinks to be a private server, and producing uh, thousands of emails for herself and evidently the State Department, but not for the American people. So she was conducting all of her government business on this separate server. And then, of course, all bets were off in terms of 
the undoing of the Freedom of Information Act, the obstruction of congressional investigations, the obstruction and fraud uh, brought upon uh, Judicial Watch and the courts and its various lawsuits that were uh, seeking information that should have been covered by the Clinton emails but weren't produced. And Judicial Watch quickly took the lead in uncovering basically everything we know to date about the Clinton email scandal. And you'll see how we even led the FBI in terms of investigating it. Folks, it's not a coincidence that Loretta Lynch was nominated on November 8, 2014 to be the Attorney General and sworn in on April 27, 2015. It's also not a coincidence that on June 21, 2013, James DeCleaner Comey was nominated as director of the FBI and then sworn in on September 4th, 2013. It's not a coincidence that all of this happened after Judicial Watch started digging into Hillary Clinton's emails. She's a national security threat along with Cheryl Mills. What they are doing is a threat to our national security. The same thing they did 20 years ago. The same thing that happened on 9-11 because of the Clintons. Possibly it was done on purpose. If it was done on purpose, more than likely it was done with the Bush administration in on it. That's for another day though, folks. But you can see the connections here that Loretta Lynch, James the Cleaner Comey, and Cheryl Mills are thick as thieves. And they're covering for each other and for the Clintons. So there you have it, folks, the Clinton Cartel Exposed. This is Call of Duty Goddess signing off, and as always, I've got your six.